eyes in the sky, gazing far into the night. I raise my hand to the fire, but it's no use, cause you can't stop it from shining through. It's true, baby, let the light shine through. If you believe it's true, baby, won't you let the light Detection Radio. I'm Kay. And I'm Chad. We pray you all had a blessed week. Who are the West Memphis Three? What has made this such a controversial case for the last 23 years? Guilty or innocent? When should the line between justice and public pressure be drawn? Tonight, joining us to discuss this and much more is researcher, radio host, and the author of Abomination, Devil Worship and Deception in the West Memphis Three Murders, William Ramsey. Welcome, William. Thank you Hi. for joining us. How are you? I'm doing great. Thanks for having me. I'm glad to be here. Oh, it's wonderful. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and say the opening prayer, and then we're going to get started. Is everyone ready? Yes. Yes. Okay. Dear Father in heaven, thank you again for bringing us all together and for blessing us with having William Ramsey come on. Please open the ears of our listeners and soften their hearts, and please lead tonight's broadcast, Father, and let us get your word out. Everything that you want to be known about this, make it come from you, Father. Please just open up all ways so that we can see. Please let no darkness come between us and our equipment tonight. Let everything run smoothly. Smoothly. Bless our audience as they listen, and please bless William, Chad, and myself. I pray this, Father, in Jesus' holy and mighty name. Amen. 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 Well, William, you have done a lot of research, and we'd like to find out a little bit about you first, and then we're going to get started in talking about the West Memphis Three. Great. I... uh... I was a recent author, actually. I'm a trained lawyer. I have a BA in history. I have a JD. I'm a member of the State Bar of California. Uh, I practiced law for about seven years. I don't really practice anymore. I do a little bit of this and that. I was always a reader, always a researcher. Even when I was in school, I would read stuff that wasn't even on the case. I mean, on the uh, school curriculum, I'd just be reading tons of books. And so I kind of got into, at a certain point in my life, I started realizing that the mass media in this country really um, constricts reality, uh, really a lot of stuff they won't touch. And so I'd always looked into stuff, and I was really a 9-11 researcher. And through reading 9-11, I realized there was a lot of occult markers in the 9-11 um, event that uh, kind of led me back to Aleister Crowley. And that's when I wrote my first book, which is Prophet of Evil, Aleister Crowley, 9-11, and the New World Order, which the general thesis is that all of those – kind of concepts work together, Aleister Crowley, 9-11, and the New World Order. And after I finished that book, I was, I wa- endeavored to ascertain, I wanted to kind of see how Crowley's effect was upon the 20th century. Crowley lived from 1875, he died in 1947. And I researched my next book, which is Children of the Beast, Beast um, Aleister Crowley's Shadow Over Humanity, which I just finished. But while I was doing that, I actually got sidetracked because I saw a video on the internet of well, from the West Memphis Three, from a movie called uh, Paradise Lost, which was an HBO film that was uh, made or uh, done in 1996. And in that clip, the prosecutor is asking um, this one of the central char- characters from the West Memphis Three, he's asking him about Aleister Crowley. So that really made me sit up in my chair. And I was like, okay, what's going on with this? And I hadn't really heard much about the West Memphis Three case. Um, I had heard about it back in like 1996 because I'd seen the first Paradise Lost. And when I first saw this video, it was like 2012. I published Abomination in 2012. So I probably saw that video about five years ago. And the West Memphis Three had just been released Uh, in 2011, actually about five years ago, five years and two weeks ago, um, they were released from prison, which is August 19th, 2011. So when I heard that they got off, I was like, oh, there must have been a technicality in the case. There must have been something wrong. 
I'd heard they'd uh, done an Alford plea. But this video really made me want to look into the case. And public perception was that they were railroaded, that the West Memphis Three were railroaded for the crime of uh, murdering three young eight-year-old boys. And so, but there was a small minority that really said that these were the, the proper um, proper people who were convicted and found guilty. Now, they did plead guilty to get out of jail. Right? The Alfred plea is a guilty plea. So I really started researching and looking into uh, that case and really in detail. And luckily, all of the case files are available online at uh, a, a website called Callahan 8K if people want to look at it. So I really was able to kind of look it down. I, I put on my legal cap and really started researching, reading everything. And <clears throat> when I started reading... Um, I uh, really saw a lot of stuff that wasn't being covered in the mass media. It wasn't being covered in films or anybody talking about, which was the occult, um, which I just said, seeing as I had studied Crowley kind of in depth, I had just seen all these occult markers and all these elements. And uh, my position uh, in the West Memphis Three was different than most people. Even the people who believe they're guilty is that I believe the occult was involved in that. One of the central characters, Damien Eccles, was into the occult. Now, what happened at the crime? The crime took place on May 5th, 1993. There were three gen, uh, central suspects. It was Damien Eccles, Jesse Miss Kelly, and Jason Baldwin. Um, they were arrested for the crime about a month later, on June 3rd of 1993. They were arrested after Jesse Miss Kelly was brought into the police station at West Memphis and, and uh, questioned, whereon he was, he uh, confessed. He confessed to the crime with the other two. They were arrested as well. Uh, because Jesse wouldn't talk, uh, wouldn't, uh, wouldn't confess an under oath at trial. The, the trials were bifurcated. Char Jesse was tried separately. Jason Baldwin and Damien Eccles were tried in a different trial. So a total of 24 jurors found them guilty the next year in 1994. And <clears throat> they basically were three documentaries that were put out by HBO in cons uh, consecutive documentaries, uh, paradise documentaries, they call it trilogy. And the first one was 1996, like I said. The next one, I think, came out maybe five years later, and then there was a third one. Each one had differing information. Um, they, the uh, two producers, Joe Berlinger and Sinofsky, Sinofsky since passed away recently, um, but uh, they were the ones that kind of spearheaded it. And uh, they... There was kind of like this phenomenon where the information that was in those, um, and it's my opinion that the information that was in those documentaries really swayed public opinion and made other people look guilty for the crime. Particularly the first, the second video, or the second film, made John Mark Byers, who was one of the stepfathers, look guilty, and then the third one made Terry Hobbs, another stepfather, look guilty, which um, should people, uh, you know, make people scratch their heads. It's serious. It's a serious red flag. Um, about that because the uh, perp changed uh, over time in that film. And then actually there was another film that was produced by Damien Eccles um, after he got out of jail um, and with the assistance of Peter Jackson, who was a kind of a world A-list director of the Hobbit films and the Lord of the Rings films, to help produce it. It was called West of Memphis, which basically spent two hours talking with the defense attorneys. Um, so <clears throat> I uh, published this book in 2012, Abomination, it's been out for four years, and I really haven't changed my opinion. I've looked into, still been following the case, and um, just to let you know, it was discovered after some research that Damien Eccles, who's the central figure in the case, uh, is a member of Aleister Crowley's OTO, Ordo Templi Orientis, which is the uh, cult order which Aleister Crowley ruled with an iron fist from about 1925 to 1947. And he also has a massive back tattoo that is of a black sun motif it's a, an astonishing tattoo that uh, he has and also one of the remarkable aspects of the case is that a number of well-known celebrities came out and really swayed public opinion in the favor of the west memphis three johnny depp um, henry rollins dave navarro natalie maines margaret cho eddie vetter all these celebrities came out and there was these musical um, shows that raised money and the amount of money that was raised was estimated to be 10 to 20 million dollars it's never really been verified but that amount of money allowed for the defense to really hire the best um, attorneys public relationship public relations people and I include those people in my book Dennis Reardon uh, Ronald Sori S-O-U-R-Y a high level 
very skilled PR guy out of New York. And um, that, that uh, really helped put pressure on the Arkansas, uh, Arkansas legal system to uh, get these guys out of jail. Now, they were never exonerated. They haven't been exonerated. They're guilty and under probation um, since 2011, and it will end in 2021. So that's basically the, the long, uh, well, you know, general outline of my book, my work, and Abomination, Devil Worship, and Deception in the West Memphis of Murders. The book is very, very well written. You get into a lot of details. I've been following the case pretty much since it started. And you're right, the media, public figures, pl has played a huge role on public perception. One thing that struck me, and it is, always has, is the fact that Jason Baldwin, I've never, ever been able to find a statement from him or an interrogation. Was there ever one that he did? Uh, not to my knowledge. I think that he went in for questioning, but I couldn't find one in the record. There was nothing in detail, although he had made statements. He admitted it to one of his cellmates said that he admitted to the murders, and that statement is in the police records. So there's a police record of that. One of the interesting things about Jason Baldwin is that he never even offered an alibi at trial. His lawyer didn't even give an alibi, which uh, is very telling. But, uh, yeah, there's really been – he's made public statements. He made statements for the Paradise Lost um, film. You know, he was on the film for part of the first one and a little bit of the second one. So he has made some statements, um, all uh, saying that he didn't do it and also – blaming his uh, one of the stepfathers, which is John Mark Byers. He said he's actually 100% convinced. Well, he made a statement with Damien Eccles where Damien Eccles says he's 100% convinced that John Mark Byers did it. And uh, just to let people know, I've done a lot of research over time. I actually got a lot of videos together of the West Memphis Three that show that they are properly guilty. And all of those videos are located on my YouTube channel at Occult Investigations. So if you can go there, subscribe, take a look at the videos, I think you'll find them all very instructive because there's also a number of other videos with these guys with major um, media figures. You know, they were on The View. Uh, Damien Nichols was on The View. He's been on, he was on a uh, talk circuit to uh, promote his book, Life After Death. And so he went on all the major talk shows. Um, he was on CNN. But a lot of those are very, were very deceptive. I mean, I showed that some of his statements are not honest. They're deceptive. And uh, mm -hmm. I showed those in those videos. So. Now, he did a very, very long show with uh, Henry Rollins, very in-depth about his book. And I don't know how you feel, but when I look at him and I look at his eyes, I don't see a soul. I see that there's this just vacant being other than being evil. Yeah, that's interesting because that's exactly what the prosecutor said. Uh, really? The penalty. Yeah, he said there's not a soul in there. Um, so he said something very interesting in the same vein, you know, 1994. And Jesse Kelly too. I get a lot of the same feeling with him. They didn't. They don't look innocent. You know, if you watch Jesse Miss Kelly during the trial, he had his head down, just looking mm -hmm. down at the floor the entire trial. And these guys, when they got convicted, they didn't even throw up a. You know, nobody cried or screamed or nobody did anything. They just took their, their sentence and went to jail. There was absolutely um, so no emotion. At, there's a, yeah, a lot of that body language is there. A lot of those are all these, these tells, those body language tells are there. So, um, but Damien Eccles, you know, the, uh, he has a very strange attitude. In all of those things about his book, he really avoids a lot of the stuff about the trial, a lot of the evidence against him. He never talks about his psych history which is a 500-page psych history. It's called Exhibit 500, which I cover in detail in my book. Um, that was actually created by his defense for his uh, capital murder penalty phase. They wanted to put mm -hmm. it forward and show, hey, this guy's well. Damien Eccles had been in three mental institutions, one in Oregon, right up to before the trial, where he had threatened to kill his parents and eat his parents and all this really nasty stuff. So he avoids talking about that. He, talk, he avoids talking about his priors. He had been arrested for breaking and entering and... Uh, I think it was unlawful. I can't remember, but there was a bunch of charges for him that he was um, busted for. He was in uh, hanging out in somebody's trailer uh, with a girl. And uh, so he had, these guys all had records. Jason Baldwin was caught shoplifting and uh, Jesse Miss Kelly was known to the prosecutors as somebody who had been beating up people 
uh, he was a fighter, you know, around that area. So they had known him. So they had all were kind of on the radar to a certain extent. But uh, yeah, Damien Nichols avoids all those questions. And the, the one of these things is he's very selective with who he gets to interview him. There's not too many um, people who are well versed in the background of the case. And some of those people are some of his supporters. When you're on there, when he's on there with Henry Rollins, Henry Rollins is going to sit and throw softball questions to him and avoid some of the more con convicting type of uh, information. So, yeah, it's interesting to watch those interviews. I think for those interviews, if you if people want to ascertain guilt or innocence, I think they're, those interviews tell a lot because a lot of that stuff, a lot of the important uh, information about the case is omitted. With him being in, Damien Eccles, being in the mental institutions, a lot of those stories are just so wild yeah. that it's hard to believe that it actually happened, but we know that it did. It's it's on record before right. any of this went down. Could you right. tell our listeners a little bit about what that included so they get an idea of exactly how he was into the occult and Aleister Crowley? Yeah, I mean, he talked, these Exhibit 500 is a 500-page document that was compiled um, by his, like I said earlier, compiled by his defense de uh, people, but the pe defense group, but the people who were in um, or who created Exhibit 500 were a group of mental health professionals, um, you know, s juvenile facility uh, operators, all these different people who who created and compiled this, but they left a repository of information that really is astonishing. It's really not believable. Like you said, there's all kinds of talk about uh, Damien Eccles uh, drinking blood. There's Eccles, you know, he wanted to, you know, commit suicide. He's drink, you know, huffing gas, uh, setting fire to property, you know, generally spacing out. Um, but there's all kinds of information like they one guy wrote he Damien Eccles fantasizes fantasizes about being all powerful um you know he he desires to gain power and to meet others you know and wants to vindicate past grievances so there's all this this other other stuff i mean he's in one time he says patient adamantly denies any contact with a devil worshiping however he readily admits to practicing witchcraft and did state that he is a practicing warlock you know, so there's all this other, um, you know, elements. He scared his sister by making reference to spells and witchcraft practices. Um, he says that he and a male have exchanged blood and his girlfriend is an individual with whom he has a strong bond. You know, so he uh, he always keeps claiming he practices witchcraft. Um, he's, he claims to have spiritual, evil spiritual possession. He says evil spirits possess me at times. And he admitted to... Um, you know, strange thoughts. So you can just read through this this Exhibit 500. It's just incredible. Did he ever make mention to the number 11? No, not to my knowledge. Uh, there was no reference, no numerological references. He did have on his shoe, he wrote 666. I think they had that in one of the records or one of the journalists saw that. And both he, at the time of the crime, both he and Jason Baldwin had evil tattooed across the knuckles of their like uh, left hand. One of the things, too, that looked extremely bad for their case is when his girlfriend, uh, Dominique, was pregnant and she was carrying a son. Right. And they'd planned to have that baby for a sacrifice. That was a generally known yeah. thing that had been said. Right. Through an informant, they said that Eccles wanted to sacrifice a baby um, she, the, the son is actually still alive. So Damien Eccles does have a son. He lives in Arizona and there's actually a picture that I include in my book of a scribble, a drawing by Damien's girlfriend, another girlfriend of a baby sacrificed in a, um, in a cemetery with a moon, a full moon and like a upside down pentagram in the sky. And when the death, the killings of the three boys occurred, it was a full moon. So, yeah, the, the whole sacrifice elements were were known, you know. And there was animal sacrifices. There were reports of animal sacrifice that, you know, was reported by some of the other journalists that people had talked about. And even Damien Eccles admitted to there, there were dead carcasses around where he was, but mm -hmm. he told the public that it was because they were roadkill. Yeah, he was very close to uh, Satan, I believe. Well, he himself said that he... Um, you know, he wanted, he wants to be, he wrote, he left a lot of writings about it, about his, you know, he would, 
he would write stuff, but he said he wanted to be Satan's art, art, artillery captain. Um, and other people uh, had said stuff about him, like he said, de de uh, the devil tells me what to do and I do it. He had, some people had heard him say, make that statement. Um, this is an interesting uh, quote from Damien Eccles. He says, I will be the king of freaks. I see a perfect explosion, God's ammunition dump going up in the flames of righteousness, Satan storming heaven, his artillery captain, a fiercely grinning fool with red flayed cheeks, Damien by name, never to be Michael Hutchison again. The end is here. Kiss your butt goodbye. Uh, and so Damien Eccles' former real given name is Michael Hutchison, but he changed his name to Damien and took the name of his one of his stepfathers, Eccles. Do you believe that he was born into a family that were Satan worshipers. It seemed as if all, his all the mother... Evidence, yeah, all the evidence points to that, you know. Uh, and I wouldn't be the only one to believe that. I, I think that some other people, his uh, his uh, youth officer, Jerry Driver, thought the same thing. Uh, they also believe that other people were there. I think that, for some reason, Jesse Miss Kelly um, implicated Damien Eccles and Jason Baldwin, but I personally believe that the night of the murders, there were other people there that uh, were never, never fingered. And I do believe that the mother, uh, one of the interesting things that I point out in my book that nobody ever wants to talk about is the, uh, the test that was given to uh, Damien Eccles to ascertain its guilt. It was a polygraph test that he failed. And the police said, okay, when you, why don't you just fess up? He says, let me talk to my mom. So after I talk to my mom, I'll tell you everything. So they say, okay. So they go, the police go get his mom talks to his mom and then he clams up and never tells the truth. So there was something to do with him and his mom. And I show in my book from the police records that his mom took him around to different bookstores to help him find uh, books. Cause Damien Eccles was always reading books, you know, he's a reader. And um, so even in the book, which uh, I include is also the death of one of his mother's roommates that happened during a bonfire in the middle of the night on the Mississippi river that happened in 1993 as well under very suspicious circumstances. So the family wasn't some, uh, you know, they, they just had a very, they had a shadow of other things going on with them. But I think uh, all the evidence shows that he's part of a satanic group and a family and that he, they answered this in the case files. It shows that they answered to somebody else who they called Lucifer and they had a name for him that was seemed to be the head of the cult, you know. So uh, and there were all kinds of other people that that the police, you know, fingered as being involved in cult activity. So mm -hmm. uh, I think that the, there was a larger network, even like da Domini, uh, you mentioned the name Domini Tier, her family, like her cousins were involved in some kind of vampire blood drinking group in San Bernardino, where they said, you know, drinking blood is normal. Mom drinks blood, dad drink, you know, something. She said something like, mom drinks blood, dad drinks blood, big deal, you know. And uh, Damien Eccles is involved in all this blood drinking, which says it gives him power. So they were part of a larger network, no doubt. Well, their son that they had, he has he looks almost like a twin of Damien's, and he has got an extensive police record himself. Right. He keeps ending up in jail in Arizona. Right. And what do you make, though, of Chris Bunch and Brian Holland that were questioned the two and that failed? Went out, yeah, the two that went to San Diego? Yes. Yeah, so there, there's other elements of the story. The police, you know, people say the police, like, keyed in. They had tunnel vision, Damien Eccles' tunnel vision, but there's a lot of other elements of what happened to the case. People that they didn't interview, people who were suspicious, people were involved, but they ne they thought could be involved, but weren't ever, didn't have enough evidence to uh, do it. And two were these two kids who went to, uh, right after the crime, they moved to San Diego. And they were very suspicious. Um, they could have been involved. They probably knew what really happened. They just weren't talking. But they were never... Didn't have, there was never enough evidence to charge them, so the police never charged them. I've That's always had a feeling that even the police, someone in the police department could have been involved because I think there were other adults that were there, and it seemed really strange that all the evidence that was gathered, they lost. Well, there was some. They lost the evidence. There was a, a man called Bojangles, a guy mm -hmm. that the night of the murders walked out of the dark and into a bathroom at a Bojangles restaurant covered in mud and blood and uh, sat in the bathroom for an hour. And the police went there, scraped up the blood, put it in a container, which then disappeared, which is very strange, you know. 
uh, especially at such a big case that they would lose that evidence. So mm -hmm. um, that's just one element that kind of makes you sh uh, scratch your head. And getting to the night that uh, the kids were murdered, what was the satanic aspects of that? I know that it was close to Crossroads, which has a significant role in, in uh, Satanism, right. and also the full moon. But what were some of the other aspects that made you tie that into being an occult sacrifice? Well, the, the, the children were bound in a strange way. Uh, they were bound ankle to wrist. There was uh, both wrists were tied right wrist to right ankle, left wrist to left ankle. So that was very, and there were strange knots. There were different knots on each one. And in um, the encyclopedia of uh, witchcraft, which Damien Eccle used as a reference, there's this idea of cord magic where you tie these cords with knots and they store power. So I saw that as an element of the case. Also the fact that one of the children had their genitals removed. And me, I've seen other uh, ritual occult cases where the um, sexual organs are considered to be uh, an object of power, you know. So uh, that was another indicator. Um, the fact that they were drowned, two were drowned. One died from uh, bleeding out, but two were drowned, which is consistent with um, a water sacrifice that I've seen in other other witchcraft cases um, and witchcraft events where they drown somebody for alchemical purposes where you kind of, I don't exactly understand it, but that's what I think that that was actually a water sacrifice. They threw them in water. And Jesse Miskelly said he saw them wiggling like worms. You know, something very specific about uh, the event, which is, which is actually factually accurate with uh, the factual record of the death. So that was it. They also found candle wax um, at the scene that was blue candle wax. And uh, so everything did have a ritual component to it. I wasn't there. It's hard to tell. They're not talking. But that seems like uh, that that's what happened. Um, and I, it, well, it was ignored. You know, it was largely ignored by the media. It was largely ignored by the celebrities. Um, and the FBI, you know, but doesn't believe that occult crimes really occur. Something called the landing report kind of uh, downplays uh, cult rituals or cult murders as motivated by either something really by something else. And uh, I read the landing report. It's actually kind of ridiculous the kind of way that they categorize occult crimes. And so that's why I included a lot of occult crimes um, in my book, Abomination, just to show that some people are motivated by the occult or motivated by uh, occult ideas to commit crimes. Yes, and several of those had been advocated for by famous people and let yeah. out and they reoffended. Right. Yeah, I called it uh, cause celebre is, is kind of like what a lot of people refer to those. So I did include like saw cause celebre killers in my book, you know, people who did reoffend. Um and like that one guy whose name is uh uh oh god now I can't remember his name. Uh but you know there's people uh I mean I I put Damien Eccles as one of those, one of those kind of cause celebrity types, but the uh, Mumia Abu Jamal is, was one of the people who I, uh, he was like the guy who's all the evidence shows that he committed the crime, but all these celebrities are behind him. Another one was a lesser known figure by the name of Jack Abbott. And then I also included Jack Underwager or Underwager as people who the celebrities, you know, helped get out of jail through their persistent efforts. And then went went on to reoffend again. Do you think Damien will? It's a good question. You know, I think uh, I think uh, it's clear from the evidence of what's happened since he's been out of jail that his occult practices have not diminished in any shape or form. So he's still he's involved in some op, uh, group that uh, propounds a magic revolution, and uh, he's still he's got tattoos all over his body. He has that back tattoo that I told you about, the Black Sun, which has all kinds of symbolical meaning. And um, he's out making talismans uh, based on the Theban language, or the which is the witch language, selling those. So, And his associations are pretty remarkable, the people that he's associating with. Um, really long time, pretty um, infamous occultist people like Genesis P. Orge. Um, and so... Uh, it doesn't look good. 
it really just doesn't look good. He, you know, if you look at some of the stuff that happened to him uh, while he was in jail and the stuff he wrote about, he thought he was undergoing some transformation on his body where he was eating Kool-Aid to um, transform himself. So he had this kind of deranged ideation that, um, you know, is, is uh, indicative of people who are psychotic. I mean, basically psychotic in the sense that you're not attached to reality. So I would say that, uh, you know, I'm not a police officer, but, uh, you know. You know. The past kind of speaks a little bit maybe for the present, and I pray that doesn't happen. Likewise. I mean, I mean, I think it's interesting when you look at this case, if you are a pedophile or have sexual assaults against children, you get put on a list and people watch you. You're on some kind of like list. But if you kill kill three kids and get out of jail and still plead guilty, you're not on a list. So I don't even think he's in New York and people know that they have a convicted child killer living next. Oh, it makes a hair on the back of my neck stand up. Yeah, it's actually really incredibly dark, um, demonic, you know, that it's really just uh, an element of the case that that's really problematic is how little proper attention the mass media has given to it. Uh, you know, they haven't really applied to any critical thinking skills at a very fundamental or elemental elementary level to determine whether the guy's guilty. But there are other people out there who are still kind of fighting the good fight. You know, there are people on websites and there's a few Facebook people who all know. And Damien Eccles has kind of been, you know, it's kind of like people are keeping an eye on him because right after he got out of jail, he moved to Salem, um, Massachusetts, the place where the witch trials took place. Um, he said that he moved there because it felt safe. He felt like um, he could be safe from persecution, which is an interesting statement because it kind of makes it seem like he is admitting to being a witch, you know. And there's tons of like practicing witches and stuff like that there. While he was there, he was practicing uh, what's called hermetic reiki, or which is a kind of energy work you supposedly work your hands over people, and. Uh, he um, ran into a lot of people there. There was this huge kind of uproar. Um, he had supporters there, but there were also people. One of the interesting things about that element of Damien's life while he was in Salem is that when he was arrested, they found the book The Exorcist by Peter Blatty. Well, guess who lived in Salem at the time with Damien Eccles? It was Mike Blatty, the son of the exorcist author. And he was really the first person who keyed into actually like reading the court cases and looking at Exhibit 500. And the fact that they're guilty and go, hey, man, this is guy's dangerous because he had, Mike Blatty had children. And that kind of uh, really blew up um, in in Salem. People really started to talk about it. Um, Damien, you know, because th there's been this persistent element of the case where I'm in there, keep saying they're innocent and nothing happened. And um, that's fooled a lot of people. But uh, Mike, Mike Blatty wasn't fool fooled. And uh, that led to Damien. Actually, I was told, and, you know, I haven't been able to confirm this, but he didn't have a proper permit to practice hermetic Reiki and that got shut down. So then his, he and his wife moved from Salem to New York where they live right now. They're somewhere in New York City. What do you make of Pam Hobbs and John Byers flipping? I mean, it was their children that were murdered. John Byers' stepson. Stepson, right. But Pamela, it was her son. What do you make of them kind of slip, flipping the switch now and being huge supporters to where they will sit down and dine with the three people that were accused of murdering their children? Right. So after the crimes, those two were all saying they had the right people. They're on video saying they did it. Um, and something happened over those years. Because of the celebrity involvement, because of the eye of Hollywood, because of their fame, um, you know, each one of those videos, each one of those uh, videos brought in money. And it's my understanding a lot of the were those guys were under contract to be in films and under contract to give interviews, uh, were paid money. And one of the more disturbing aspects of the case is how um, Hollywood money changed these people's opinions. Uh, it's really, it's really remarkable. A lot of them won't talk about their prior opinions, you know, after they, their opinions had changed. And there, there's not a lot of public, they don't, they don't give public interviews easy. I can tell you from personal experience. I never really chased, uh, chased down the families when I was researching the book. I didn't really talk to any first person. There was tons of information that I could find uh, from journalists and stuff like that to actually figure out what really happened. But uh, 
I know that Pam Hobbs had some gripes against uh, Terry Hobbs, and you know there was tons of money going around. There's just I think that some of the contracted money was in the five figures, you know. So uh, interesting things can happen when people put money on the table. I mean, look, I mean, it's a perfect example of John Douglas. John Douglas is this very well-respected FBI profiler. He's on TV shows. He writes tons of books. People think that, you know, he's, he's super upstanding. But in this case, in particular, he bungled the case. Um, it's clear that he either had somebody else read it or, uh, you know, talk, do, do uh, something else. Because he said there was nothing indicative. And this was one of his statements out of the book is he said there was nothing indicative in the court records that showed these guys had a propensity for crime. And that is clearly <laughs> fallacious because, yeah, you can look um, you can look in the court case, and just like I spoke uh, talked about earlier, is that they were all known to the police, you know? Um, so it, uh, I wrote in that part of the book, I wrote, John Douglas, failure, failure to read. Because he wrote, here he goes, this is exactly what he says. This is a direct quote. He says, there is nothing, J Damien and Jason had no indicative violence in their past. And J Damien and Jason, there was like evidence that he tortured a dog, Damien did, and that, uh, you know, he was licking people and threatening people and threatening his, par his parents. So, um, you know. Yeah, there uh, was a lot of money. Yeah, a lot of money. 10 to, 10 to $20 billion. And all we were million, hearing, yeah, yeah it was... Michael Moore's stepdad, John Byers, saying, you know, we're not getting it. Where's that money went, gone to? And then all at once, everyone kind of changed their tune. So it it does make a person wonder if maybe some money did exchange hands just to to placate them. I've known that there is a contract. A lot of those guys were contracted for some of those films, so they got paid money. And uh, that was probably the reason for the second and third part of the Paradise Lost. They had a franchise. They literally made a trilogy of films that documentaries are relatively cheap to produce. And I'm sure those were cash cows, you know, they created more controversy. And that phenomenon is still going on today. You know, a lot of those films about uh, making a murderer and that oh, there's another girl who's done something called Serial about another killing where um, third parties come in and, you know, stir things up and make things sound more salacious and more uh, controversial to sell their product or sell themselves. And, uh, you know, making a murderer is incredible. What the public really thinks happened in that case. Those two guys, Avery and Daisy, are guilty as heck. I mean, to believe that somebody else did it, you got to believe whoppers. You got to believe, you got to believe somebody went to their house where nobody was, murdered some girl for strange reasons, then burned her body in a, in a bonfire what nobody else saw. And then believe that Daisy was forced to give that confession, and then forced to call his mom and tell him he was, did it. I mean, it's and then they then dumped the car in there, uh, girl's car. So you know, it's that, that, I mean, crazy. Yeah, it's crazy. Daisy was just released um, for, I guess, constitutional violations about his uh, his confession and the interview they did, which is all videotaped. You can just hear him slowly talking about the crime, um, which doesn't mean that he didn't do it. It just means that they didn't follow proper procedure. Uh, so uh, those guys are guilty as hell. And it's the same with serial. So, and it's the same thing as the, and that's the distortion that took place with this West Memphis three case. In my opinion is how outside third parties came in, saw an opportunity to make money, create controversy, uh, create notoriety. And that's what happened. I mean, if you think an hour and a half documentary is really uh, insight into a criminal case, I mean, you know, I don't know. So it's it's really pretty. Dis it's a disturbing phenomenon. It's happening more often. You know, I would definitely uh, advise any listeners into court cases to really go down and get into the nitty gritty to see what really happened in some of these cases. Because I can tell you, for the West Memphis Three cases, these these films did that case a disservice. I got in, and I've read the autopsy reports for all three of the kids. What they went through. No human being should ever have to go through that. It It's horrendous. It's horrendous that anyone could even consider doing that. Yeah, I mean, those cases are awful. And Werner Spitz was is, is this famous uh, forensic expert who came and testified on the case. He says all the damage done to those boys is due to 110-pound 
snapping turtles that came out and did that. But if you look at the uh, the autopsy report, as you have, you know that they endured much worse stuff than anything a snapping turtle could inflict, even if it's 110 pounds, because they were uh, beaten with something like a stick. I mean, unless a 110 pound snapping tur turtle can swing a bat, um, mm -hmm. you know, the evidence shows that they were beaten. One was beaten unconscious with some kind of stick that was either hidden or they never found it. But um, and then the left side of one of the little boys' face was stabbed. I mean, it's clear stab wounds. Oh, <laughs> and even the more head also. Yeah, you know, yeah, yeah. What say that again? On top of the head, when they had to shave, that was not a snapping turtle bite. That was a, a knife wound. Yeah. Well, what's really disturbing, and I really haven't talked about this, and this is another aspect of the ritual component to the cases, is one of the boys had an X upon his forehead. Um, an X has kind of like, a, it, it can mean a lot. It has an occult significance. But Damien Eccles, every time he tattoos, he'd been tattooing some of his followers and some of his more hardcore friends. He tattoos them with an X, symbol of an X, and the symbol of a skeleton key. So there's actually some, one researcher noted that similarity between Damien Eccles' tattoos and one of the kids that was murdered. Well, just for the X, Damien is charging $200. Right. Just to do that. How, how can... Yeah, people I, get paid, yeah. It's weird. There's a lot of these murder groupies and strange people who um, are out there. I mean, he has one of, the, one of the unexpected elements of the case, and one of the things that would probably baffle most people is the concerted effort these guys have had on public media and social media to, to, to kind of bolster... Um, the whole meme of Damien Eccles and, and Jason Baldwin and Jesse Miss Kelly being railroaded for wearing black T-shirts. There's tons of people out there who put out that information, and there's a, they have a lot of supporters. There's a core group of people who will get out there and say anything on these guys' defense, and it's a real question as to why it's happening. But they've harassed almost every person who's ever uh, made it, including me, people who've ever said these guys are properly guilty. There's a one uh, crime writer by the name of Trench Reynolds who basically got gang stalked, harassed. He almost quit his blog. He was like, what's going on? These people are really vicious. And he called followers of Damien Eccles, and I think this is a, this is highly appropriate. He called them Ecclesologists in the vein of Scientologists. And uh, <clears throat> wow. yeah, it's really true because they have just this unyielding uh, position that they're innocent when all the facts show that they're guilty as heck, you know. So, uh, but you sound like you've done your homework because you got a lot of these details down. Um, but uh, oh yeah, I just have never understood. And for some reason, when this all happened back in '93, as a mother, that just it ripped my heart out. Yeah, I mean it's 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 uh, there. It doesn't get any more depraved than what happened on May 5th, 1993. So, it's a very sinister uh case with you know damien eccles if you read the the some of the stuff he writes he has a very high opinion of himself within the satanic hierarchy he thinks of himself as you know this very intelligent person and you know uh it's really remarkable people really need to sit up in their chair and think about this case and think about the facts of the case and um, if they think they're innocent you need to go through a reappraisal of uh of the facts now, you made a statement in your book, and it was an actual quote from the trial with Damien Eccles on the witness stand. Uh, he kept saying, well, common sense would tell you. Could you elaborate more on what he exactly said and what he was getting at? Because I found that part of the book, it really jumped out at me. Well, it was during, uh, the prosecutor's name was Davis, and he was really just grilling uh Eccles about uh, black magic. It's, you know, he had written a bunch of stuff about how he was interested in LeVay. And, uh, you know, he admitted to frequently carrying knives. But, um, you know, he, he had left uh, records and stuff. And, he, you know, he was explaining things about... He had explained stuff to police about when he was questioned. I think it was right after the murders. He had said things like, uh, you know, his answer was... Somebody asked him a question, how do you think the person feels who did this? Probably makes them feel good, gives them power. And so um, that was what the prosecutor said to Eccles. And he says, no, I just use common sense on that. So he seems to think that that was powerful. And people had seen Eccles after the crime looking excited 
Um, there's one friend of Jesse Miss Kelly who said he was all amped up after the murder. So, you know, a lot of this stuff, you know. And David says, so in your mind, the person that killed these three kids, it's common sense that killing three-year-olds would make you feel good. And then Eccles responds, whoever did it, it must have. And then David says, okay, it gives them power. That's also another common a common sense perspective from you. And Eccles replies, pretty much. Um, so you told the officer, you told him you thought the person who did it would think it was funny. And Eccles said, yes. So, you know, it shows um, some very strange ideation uh, by Damien Eccles. Yeah, I've noticed quite a few similarities in there. I mean, uh, what was it? Uh, uh, Michael Aquino, the uh -huh. founder of the Temple of the Set. You know, I'm talking about the, the Satanist that's actually yes. in the army. Uh -huh. And, uh, you know, that's the thing is, you know, you're talking about uh, Eccles being affiliated with the OTO. Well, you know, you got Charles Manson, Aleister Crowley, you got Kenneth Grant. Uh, yeah. uh, who else you got? Um, Tons. I mean, David Bowie was a su suspected member. A lot of high-level people are suspected to be in the OTO, but it's hard to tell, you know. I've well, heard that uh, James Franco is supposed to be an OTO member. Um, you know, a lot of these guys. So uh, I think well, plus, that the David, yeah, the David Bowie is very believable. Well, that's the thing is that I know that uh, when you start getting into the Satanism and magicians and everything, they they claim or they refer to themselves as an artist. Right. That's the thing is that, you know, this, this is an art. It's not, you know, they don't necessarily use the terms, you know, Satanism or whatever stuff. They refer to it as, you know, art and casting spells and so on. They talk about the left-hand path, the right-hand path, and all that kind of stuff. But, you know, you also said something about the, um, the Scientologist or whatever stuff. Echologist, yeah. Yeah, the Echologist. Uh, you know, that, that right there, I mean, that L. Ron Hubbard, and Parsons, they were the understudies of uh, Aleister Crowley. Yeah, I mean, I wouldn't be surprised if uh, Parsons or Hubbard had an OTO charter or to OTO membership. I know that Parsons well, they, did. They were his protégés. That's the thing is they were his understudies. They were the ones that performed the Babylon working ritual out there where Area 51 is at, yeah. where they supposedly opened a portal in space-time that they couldn't close. That's the rumor. I mean, they, the Babylon working was trying, I mean... My understanding of reading it is that it's a, it was an OTO ritual that their intent was to f facilitate change towards the kind of aeon of Horus. That was the idea of the ritual, is to change society in conformance kind of with uh, OTO precepts and Crowley's precepts. You know, so. And then some of the research that we have been doing, uh, when we talked to uh, Thomas Dunn, who did a film called Detestable, have you seen that yet? I did, I did see it. Okay, really well, good. And you remember what I'm talking about, you know where I'm going with them, this where I was talking, or when uh, they talked about the uh, one lady that was a victim in a town where the entire town was infiltrated right. with Satanists. I mean, it was the police force, the politicians, and so on. Yes. And that's yeah. another thing. People don't realize just how, you know, integrated they are. I mean, it's it's... They are, they are in the police force. They are politicians. You know, they're doctors. They're lawyers. I mean, they're people you would never suspect. Yeah, it's true. That's that's the whole thing. It's just like Rosemary's Baby, you know. The doctors involved, all these other people are involved. So it probably wasn't much different in West Memphis. You probably had uh, some people involved in, you know, the Christian walk and then people the left-hand path, and you don't really know who they all are. They know each other, but they keep quiet. You know, they operate on a code of silence, so. Yeah, because it's hard to believe that they botched that much stuff, you know, during the investigation, the trial, and everything. I mean, the, the, there had, like you said, there had to have been other people that were there that were probably key role members in society, probably even people on the police force, for all we know. You don't know. You don't. You know, I think that they, uh, you know, were working under difficult circumstances. I think the prosecutor even said that. Uh, you know, he had a 50-50 chance based upon what he can put in court, you know. Uh, there's a lot of stuff that I included in my book that are from the police records of people who just didn't want to testify, disappeared, um, and people changed their story. One guy said that, you know, he admitted stuff to Eccles, and then like 10 years later, he's like, oh, no, that never happened. Same thing happened with another lady. Like, why are you changing your story? Because you told it in court. And if you're lying, that's perjury. But well, their stories mm -hmm. changed publicly, you know. Why did that change? And that happened a lot in those cases. That's just like the same thing of how John Mark Byers got turned, you know? So how did these people get turned? I know I got offered money in a subtle way. I didn't take it, but some people did. I bet a lot of people took money. 
You know, there's all kinds of weird things that happen in that case. The PI was involved. Um, this guy Lax, who was intimidating people, uh, getting people not to testify. There's all kinds of very strange things. When you have 10 or $20 million floating around, a lot of strange things happen. At the end of the case, they actually put, I mean, get this, how much biased information are you going to get if you put a billboard up saying, if you know information about the West Memphis 3 case, call us here for a reward. And all these people came out of the woodwork. Guys who've been convicted of rape, people were in jail for burglary. Oh, yeah, my, they had like double hearsay. And they actually put this into West of Memphis. Oh, my brother's sister said there was a family secret at um, the Terry Hobbs house. And it sounded, you know, to weak-minded people, that sounds like it has some kind of meaning. But it's just a well-crafted story to manipulate, you know, people out of court. Because double hearsay in any court of law in this country is a joke. It's a total joke. But people try to put that. I mean, it's just like really crazy stuff happened with this case that people try to bandy about. And then it should make you beg the question... Why is that kind of nonsense put out like it's legit? That's really it. Yeah, another interesting thing is when you were talking about the, the ritual taking place near water and that they were uh, put into the water. Uh, I don't, I'm not sure if you're aware of this, but uh, Thomas Dunn also put up a clip of the area where they took Guy, who was in the movie, uh-huh. and it, it was right next to the ocean. Yeah. I mean, that that was the thing. They had, like, rock pillars and stuff and looked like a, uh, you know, rock slabs there, like uh, altars and everything. I mean, it was it was crazy. Yeah, I believe. I mean, the real, I think there's something about the, the river's edge being between two worlds, between earth and spirit, you know. So there's simple, symbolic stuff that happens. Um, I don't claim to be an expert in magic. I really should go back through and look through all the magical practices of Crowley because I think it would really show... Uh, or enlighten me about what a lot of these other people do, you know. But well, you, you ought to check out the uh, episode that uh, Daniel Duvall did with uh, Justin Fall on the Fourth Watch. They did okay. an episode called uh, the uh, what was it? Uh, Water Spirits. Interesting. And it is very, very interesting. I mean, they break down a lot of stuff that has to do with the fallen angels and the oceans and the water and so on. It was pretty interesting. I am writing that down. I was on Justin Falls show just recently so i will go back and look at that yes i can't wait to hear it <laughs> yeah, she, she justin let me know um a couple days ago that he interviewed you and i was like oh we're gonna interview him on tuesday and i can't wait yeah um i i don't you know i always kind of get different questions so all the this the discussions about my books are all different because people have different questions and you know so yeah. it should be good should be uh, good. What is the significance, I mean, I know, but maybe a lot of listeners don't know, what is the significance of Crossroads? Well, I actually just had this discussion with Justin about Crossroads, I guess, and, and the Crossroads, uh, so Robert, this is just a modern example of Robert Johnson, who was this blues guitar player, who's really the foundation of all Western rock music, blues to rock, um, he uh, supposedly made a deal with the devil at the crossroads, which is actually in Rose, I think it's Rosemond or Rosewood, Mississippi, which is about 30 or 60 miles from Memphis. Um, but that deal supposedly gave him the power to become a great, uh, great blues, uh, blues musician and guitar player. But I guess it goes back into, goes back into all ancient lore and, uh, mythology where the crossroads is a place for people to come in contact with gods. And as a as a place of meeting for the spirit world, and uh, that's that's my understanding of what that significance is. Almost like intersecting ley lines. I, I don't know. I mean, maybe in the modern world, but uh, I think back then that was that's where that's that's where that notion comes from. Is you can meet your god or Satan or the devil at the crossroads. I think there's actually a movie called The Crossroads out there. There is. Yeah. I was just going to bring that up. It's an excellent movie, and it explains a lot well there's there's several um music artists that have you know on video actually saying that they basically made a deal with the devil and they sold their soul i know dylan is one of them um i think uh, beyonce and a few others they've actually katie gone on record perry. katie perry yeah well i include actually in my book as an example of occult crimes this band who was in um kind of by san luis obispo here in california who sacrificed a girl for the benefit of the band you know that was their idea they were going to sacrifice something to get their band in better place so you know people do this kind of occult things to um you know maximize their whatever you know 
their, their benefit from the, the dark side, I guess. At the time of these uh, murders, it had already been known in West Memphis that they had a problem with occult, the occult. No doubt. And then when the murders happened, then it was like, oh, yeah, we knew that, you know, this was going on and that was going on. But no one ever spoke up against it. Do you think that there were more people there involved in the cult, the occult than weren't? I don't know. You know, I don't know what it was like in West Memphis. I mean, the, the community, it's basically is West what, uh, Memphis, Tennessee. It's kind of like a middle class to lower middle class uh, community. But, uh, you know, the police testimony and all the stuff that was compiled by the cops, you know, showed people are like, oh, yeah, I saw this dangerous writing in the in Robin Hood Hills. There were all these pentagrams around. We heard weird chanting. We saw people in capes come in and out of the uh, forest. So it was there. You know, how much? I don't know. I really don't. But I think that people knew. They just probably never in their in their dream, you know, in their imagination could imagine that it would come to that, you know, mm -hmm. that people would ramp it up. But it's pretty clear from, you know, looking at the court records that Eccles was headed towards that direction, you know. They had been stealing animals. They, Jesse Miss Kelly, they would go out to this place, Stonehenge, and sacrifice dogs and eat them, eat part of them. I mean, these guys were real... Hardcore. Damien Eccles burned down somebody's garage and sat in the, the flames and chanted, you know. So uh, this kind of occult obsession uh, was still there, you know. So yeah. uh, it's just a really disturbing. And unfortunately, I think that in, if you look at certain communities, there's a lot of occult stuff going on. You know, they, people don't recognize. They don't know what it is. But that element of our society is there, you know, probably in major, major cities, Los Angeles and New York. And these cults are still around, you know, the Process Church and OTO and all these other organizations. There's still people out there that are, um, you know, engaged in all kinds of bad deeds that really just aren't identified as occult actions, I think. That's something that we all need to be educated in. Now, you mentioned Stonehenge. I want the listeners to know they're not talking about the Stonehenge that you're all familiar with. Stonehenge was actually a place that there was an old cotton gin right. that the kids went to. And there was also an old abandoned house or a schoolhouse, wasn't there? Yeah, that's right. I think there was a house that they went to. Um, so there were these abandoned places that they would go to, and there, there was... I mean, in the, the police statements that they gave to the, you know, these different people gave to the police, there was all kinds of stuff going on. There's like a sexual assault and just drinking and drugs. and uh, Yeah, it's, it's bad. You know, bonfires. There was one man that you recounted his uh, statement that he had been to one of the rituals that had the, the drinking of the blood that they'd killed a dog and drained the blood into a bucket and that they had to actually eat part of the dog leg to be brought into the cult. Yeah, now, I think it was Alvis Clem Bly, is that right? That's it. Yeah. And when the murders yeah. took place, the one thing that was extremely strange, there wasn't any blood. No, there was. There actually really was. If you look at the court case, Go look at the court records and look up luminol test. There was tons of blood. Was there? I missed yeah. that part. Yeah, there was tons of blood. It just wasn't into ev uh, brought into evidence. The luminol at that time in 93 was not uh, allowable into evidence in court, but oh. the old pictures of the luminol tests are there. They took the test right after, and there was blood all over the place. There was clearly a part, John Fogelman, one of the prosecutors, talked about it, where there was on the side of where the water was in... Uh, Robin Hood Hills, there was a slicked down part that it's pretty clear that there was an attempted cover up of what happened on that side of of the uh, berm or embankment. But there was blood on the leaves. There was all kinds of residue. And uh, I think I have that. If you go to the cold investigations, I think the, I think it's under early investigation. You can see a video of the pictures of all the luminol blood. Okay, I'm going to do that. I always thought that they possibly murdered the children from somewhere else and then brought them I don't think that's to... plausible. I think that theory isn't plausible. There's been all kinds of other stuff that they were taken out and brought back. Um, but uh, the reason why it's not is because, one, the tons of blood was there. They were drowned. 
Um, and, uh, you know, it's just there There was a search going on. There was a, a, a window of time between 5.30 and 7.30 or 8 where it had to have happened. Mm -hmm. And nobody saw people driving out or coming back. The bikes were found very nearby uh, in, a, in another kind of drainage area. So uh, I don't find that, that theory plausible. There's a tons and tons of implausible theories associated with this case. Well, they did find a footprint, and I've not been able to find anything where they had taken a cast of it. I saw the picture, but do you know if they ever did anything with the footprint? I don't. I don't think so. I don't think they ever did. I don't think they ever tied it to anybody. But that guy, Alvis Klumbly, this is what he says. He says, we would just go out there. One of the guys had a double worshiping book. We would go buy it, which mm -hmm. was sacrificing dogs or chicken. We would drain their blood. Then they would take and cut the heart out and put in the center of the pentagram and set fire to it and worship the devil. I would have been running. Yeah, it's very clear. You know, this guy, he was, this was not a good person. He was, he was in jail at the time when he was interviewed by the cops um, because he was raping his eight-year-old stepdaughter. But he was a resident of Lakeshore Trailer Park where Jason Baldwin lived. So. Mm -hmm. Like what, a couple, couple trailers away, if I remember right? Yeah, something like that, very close. And J you know, Jason, yeah, I mean, it's just, it's really bad. He, his parents were cousins. He's actually kind of like one of these stories of the South, you know, like scary stories, but yeah, it's, uh, it's wow. On the videos that I have watched with the interrogations of Chris Bunch and Brian Holland, and in your book, you make a statement that someone had claimed that there was someone else in West Memphis that walked around with a long coat like Damien Eccles wore. And I noticed in the interviews, I couldn't see the faces very well, but just from the outline in the hair, Brian Holland looked very, very much like Damien Eccles, like he was trying to emulate him. Interesting. I mean, I was told that there was something like a trailer part. I mean, uh, was a trench mar uh, trench coat mafia that was in uh, West Memphis, kind of like there was in Col Columbine, a group of people who walked around in trench coats. Oh, so yeah, so there was some, there might have been some kind of connection like that. But there's clearly a group. The police identified some people. Um, all the people were black and hung out together, and you know, somewhere in the occult. But the list of the people that the police identified as being part of the cult is in the police files. And you have a very very long list too in your book of the people that were interrogated and had lie detector tests and those that had that were what is it undetermined they weren't right. be able they weren't able but it's huge yeah i mean that was you know i mean they tried to say that they just focused on them but they took i mean you can go through the police files i think my list is like 40 people mm -hmm. that they brought in investigated or removed from suspicion you know yeah, so they didn't just stop. I've always been rather on the fence trying to gather all the information I can. When it breaks down, though, how do you feel? I know that the police department was under a lot of pressure. Absolutely. I think in big cases like that, all the police departments are under pressure. That's true. How do you feel that they conducted it? Well... I know for a fact they had, and there were rumors about that police department being corrupt. They're on a drug pipeline next to the highway, and there were rumors about them being involved. So um, they they did, after the murders happened, they took people from their drug task force and put them on the murder case. So they had about 12 uh, police working on that. And, you know, they, they lost the, the Bojangles' blood, which I think is a mistake. I think uh, they may have... You know, the, the distance between the time of arresting um, Eccles, you know, knowing, thinking that Eccles was one of the people involved and then the arrest led to a lot of evidence being destroyed, even though they found tons of stuff at his place. Um, but, you know, they, these guys probably had tons of things that they got away with. We know that uh, Jesse Miss Kelly gave his shoes to one of his friends after the murders. And that guy was actually interviewed by police. And I can't remember his name right now, but that's at my uh, website at YouTube, Occult Investigations. But uh, so those shoes disappeared. Those might have had blood that would be, um, you know, of great value in a court case with not a lot of direct evidence. And uh, so, you know, it's hard to say. I, I, can't, I can't say uh, that 
I'm a police. I know I've studied tons of other court cases and uh, it's it's very difficult. You know, they operate under difficult circumstances, circumstances. They don't have everybody's telling them the truth, but they at the end of the day, they got the right person and they put the right people in jail. You know, the right people got invic- convicted because even after the trials, Jesse Miskelly started confessing again. So he yes. had all these post conviction confessions that are recorded. You know, I call them the Bible confession confession. And then the other confession is against the advice of his attorney. His attorney sitting right there saying, don't say anything. This is dumb. Don't do it. He says, I want something done about it. I want something done. Then he goes ahead and confesses right in front of Fogelman again. So, um, and he confessed to the police officers after the trial in the car, in the car. We did it. I did. So, um, the Jesse, I mean, one of the most important aspects of the case, which the people who are defending the West Memphis three, conveniently ignore is the post conviction confessions by Jesse Miss Kelly, which are fully recorded. Um, and, uh, so, you know, I, I think it's, I think some of these cases, they're now, I've, I've read a lot of police files. I'm kind of a true, true, true crime buff and they're never really perfect. You know, there's always things that they might miss. Um, some cases are done really well, but, um, they got the right people. When they took the Alfred plea, as they did, they signed it. It was a confession of guilt, right. and they were stuck with that guilt, guilty verdict. But right. they were due for another trial within a couple months. That's why? Correct. Why do you think that they didn't want it to go to trial? They had the trial coming up in December, so it was, they got out August nineteenth, twenty eleven. The, the trial was December. It was going to be about um, the evidence, uh, the DNA evidence in the trial. But I think that they knew, and the, the their, I mean, these are the best, some of the best attorneys you could ever get. They re- recognized that they could really lose it in another trial because there was a lot of post, the post conviction statements of Jesse Miss Kelly could go right into trial. Um, so, I think that this was their way to engineer, and maneuver a way to get their clients out, and, um, you know, that that well, they were very successful in that uh, most. There was a change in prosecutors and the change in judges. And the new pod prosecutor, you know, said openly, and I have videos of that. He says, I don't believe anybody else other than the three people did it. Uh, three people who were here did it. So he, the prosecutor Ellingson said, you know, these guys are guilty, but I think that this could be a case we could lose, you know? So he didn't want to lose and he was a new guy. And, you know, the, the, the way that the public uh, perception was, is that this was some awful injustice. So he was under pressure. Um, you know, his career is on the line and this was a strategic way for him to just get rid of a troublesome case. So Mm -hmm. I think that it worked to their event. I mean, the reality is, is that they've never been exonerated. They've never done anything in the five years they've been out. Um, Miss Kelly Baldwin and Eccles to do anything to overturn that exoneration. There's been a few people crying for it, but there's never really been any active means to change this. The innocence project who are very sharp lawyers haven't taken their case. And all three of them act like they hate each other because Damian Eccles went to East Coast, Jess Miskelly stayed in Arkansas, and Jason Baldwin's on is in Washington or Portland. So mm-hmm. um, I think I think you know they the lawyers and with the with the assent of these guys who are all adults now, you know they got out of jail. You know uh, Damian Eccles was on death row. So. And Jesse has seemed to be the most quiet of the three. Yeah. Uh, yeah. It was very interesting the change of his IQ yeah. through the yeah. time he was incarcerated. Could you please tell our audience a little bit about that? Well, I think that it's to any advantage if you have somebody giving testimony if they are under seventy IQ. You know that uh, I think that 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 evidence is considered less, at least in the public sense. So. I think he he recorded an 88. It's in one recording a different type of IQ. Clearly not the sharpest um, knife in the in the drawer, but you know I think it slowly went down and now he's down to a 68 IQ. And you know I think that that's how people deal with um, undermining his initial confession that he gave on June 3rd, 1993. Is you know say oh yeah he's not smart he got railroaded. They always add all these other hours to that time too that he's in police custody for you know, 48 hours or some nonsense. I think it's 14, they say, which if you look at the court record, it's not that much. But 
Um, yeah, so you have these kind of floating IQ numbers that are bandied around that, mm -hmm. um, you know, work against Jesse's supposed forced confession. He said he couldn't tell time, and then eventually he admitted that he could. It was just all a deception. Yeah, I mean, I think it's silly for people to look at a confession and just say that somebody's never going to be deceptive at all, you know? Mm -hmm. um, it's pretty clear that he was, to me, that he's being deceptive in that confession, try to minimize his involvement. And, you know, he, he said, oh, I was there and then I left, you know. I don't know what happened later, but I wasn't there for that, you know. So he was clearly trying to minimize his involvement um, for right. me. And that should be expected. I would think that, that anybody involved in a heinous crime like that would want to do that. So, um, yeah. I mean, it's, uh, I, I, I don't, I think that if you look at that confession, a confession in the context of his post-conviction confession, he's basically telling the truth. He's never, nobody ever is going to tell this. I mean, they, people say, oh, it's not in, it's not in time order. Or there's pieces missing. Well, nobody's going to recall everything in perfect detail no. of any event ever, you know? I mean, if, if you sum it up, he was there. He was involved in it. Jason Baldwin and, Jess, and Damien Eccles were involved. He knew too much that yeah. had never been stated. Absolutely. Absolutely. Oh, and it's just to me, like I said, it's strange that out of all of them, that Miss Kelly has been the most quiet. There's not been a peep out of him that I've been able to find, really, since the day that they were released. I haven't heard anything. I have heard um, through the grapevine that there was a girl who made friends with him and either dated him. And she believed the public story that they were innocent. But after spending time with him, she realized that that wasn't um, that wasn't a proper position and, and ran for the hills. Um, so she, that girl was around on the message boards and on the Internet. I read uh, that. Her. Yeah. She's warning everyone, you know, he's gully. Yeah. Stay away from him. He's crazy. Yeah. So these guys, uh, you know, and that, that's kind of happened with Eccles. You know, Eccles, like we talked about earlier, he was in Salem. He tried to do something called magic on the mat. With Yoga Works out here in California, which is like a, the biggest kind of yoga chain. And people came out of the war. I don't even know who some of them are, but they're like, hey, you got to watch out, man. This guy has a conviction for child killing. You know, you want to actually have this guy on here? And one of these, uh, her name, if I can remember it, she was like totally convinced of all of the, all of the lies surrounding the case. Uh, Sean Korn, you can look her up, C O R N E. She has, if you can look up Sean Corn West Memphis 3, you can t see her just watch her spout every inanity and every deception involved with the case. Like, oh, yeah, these guys were walking down wearing black shirts with Metallica. Then they got arrested, you know. Um, but she was the main proponent to have this magic on the mat, and then something changed. Clearly, somebody put the screws from the very top of the organization, and that was canceled uh, to, for, uh, to, <laughs> to did Yoko, your work's benefit. But Sean Corn. One of the ele interesting element, elements of the case that nobody really wants to talk about or nobody emphasizes is the mind control aspect um, in the occult uh, people up there. They don't really have a problem, and I've seen this as very consistent in all my research with a lot of these occultists, is they don't, mind control is like the handmaiden of the occult, the ability to uh, manipulate people's minds and actions to other people's benefit. And when I see that Sean Corn girl talk, I feel like, man, you just got zapped got mind control you're not even you're not even saying anything that has any basis in reality so uh, that's an interesting aspect of Damien Eccles and there's other things where he's you know had uh, he was going to give a statement at um, some event it was a meeting somewhere in the Midwest that involved FedEx and all these big corporate players and then somebody got smart and said no man get out of here you, you got kicked out of there too so I also heard that he violated his probation and had to go back to Arkansas for holding a gun in a movie called IRL. I haven't really been able to confirm that, but that's what I heard. Um, because he's not supposed to have guns, drugs, and people. he has to keep working um, under his probation. So, uh, you know, people are still kind of following it. People are watching it from a distance, and uh, there still is, you know, a certain level of involvement in a lot of these celebrities, you know. When you say mind control, are you alluding possibly to MK Ultra? No, no. I'm just saying like techniques that people would use to um, manipulate other people's minds, you know, shape their minds, shape their positions. I saw this this interview. There's an interview with Damien Eccles with uh, uh, Goodman of uh, PBS. 
Um, and she just keeps spouting these, these, I mean, these people have never done like read a book in their life. Like they don't know anything. She's just spouting all the defense positions and the 110 pound snapping turtles. And Damien Nichols is looking at her, just nodding, nodding along, staring at her like, you're doing good. You're saying exactly what you're supposed to say. And it's really remarkable, you know, in those instances that he's like, it's like goading him on. Yeah, you got it. Yes, we weren't there. Yes, it's possibly the stepfather. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You go watch it. I think that's on my uh, YouTube channel too. So I'll you see these little out. techniques. Yeah, it's it's interesting. These people are zapped. I mean, they've been they've been shaped. Their ideas have been shaped, and their perceptions have been shaped. And that's the same with most of the public on this case. They have no idea of the actual real facts. I mean, if you get PR involved and you get other people to establish this, and you get some celebrities on your side, that's probably enough for most people to form an opinion. You know, and unfortunately, that opinion isn't right. Well, Eccles, too, if people watch any of his videos, anything that he's done, he's very selective about who he will make eye contact with. He does not make eye contact probably 99% of the time. He's always looking somewhere else. Yeah. And or it's with almost dark like, glasses, yeah. Yes. Oh, well, he, he had the excuse with the dark glasses that he has been locked up for so long in solitary confinement that it cause problems with his vision right. yeah he saw it, all of these statements about his health his teeth were about yes. to fall out oh man without reiki my teeth would have fallen out well and then this journalist who's actually had a clue is like well how are they now oh oh well they're fine now but that's like his sob story to elicit sympathy from the public that that's it you know things are going bad like oh i was just about to die that's another thing they said when they almost got released in 2011 i was almost on my deathbed I was almost going to die. Well, you were about to die for 19 years. I mean, there's really no evidence of any uh, police brutality of any shape or form. Mm -mm. You know, he also made these statements like, oh, yeah, it was so dangerous. I was about to get knifed in the back all the time. He says that in some of these other um, interviews. Well, you were in solitary confinement, dude. So I don't know whether somebody was going to jump through the bars or kind of levitate or, you know, <laughs> lose shape. <laughs> I mean, it just doesn't make sense. Like nobody ever calls him on it. Who's going to knife you if you're in solitary? How That's are you going to get knife? But he got caught up in a lie when he was talking about that because he stated that there was a way that the cell next to him, that the man that was locked up over there had a way to get through and get into his cell and he was raped at least 40 times. Yeah, that's right. I don't believe that. That's an unbelievable story too. So there's, I mean... That was one of those. And then some, actually somebody asked him, he said, are you lying about this? He said, well, I got to do something in here. I, I got to go find that clip. But like he almost admits to making up that story. And uh, I mean, there's all kinds of crazy stuff, man. I was told that I won't. I, I can't. I'll tell you about that story offline. But there's all there's stuff under the surface that would just blow your mind, man. It's incredible. The stuff that Damien Eccles is up to, you know, Uh but yeah, there's there's just tons of tons of deception involved, you know. I think the people in the cells next to him should have been more worried than he would be. Uh, yeah. I wouldn't want to be that close to him. I would agree with that. You know, but oh yeah, I was going to say there's another guy who I've uh, actually posted a lot of his work on my website. Um, it's uh, Billy Sinclair. If you go to a coldinvestigations.com, he's done some excellent writing about Damien Nichols, but he was in jail. Um, he was involved. Billy Sinclair was involved in an armed robbery where somebody unfortunately died, but he spent, I think, 20, 25 years in jail. And he's an excellent writer. He got out and works for a law firm now, but he stumbled upon the West Memphis 3 case and just said, holy smokes, this guy is full of baloney because he had been in jail. So he knew all the true jail stories. And he had, you know, he's a guy who's had that experience. Um, I think he was easier for him to detect Somebody's deceptive. So all I've been posting all of his uh, excellent articles that he's wrote about the West Memphis Three at coldinvestigations.com. That's also where you can buy my books. If you want signed copies for my books, go there. Um, but uh, really fascinating guy. He said that his he his website got hacked and destroyed. They said that his he said his his um, web company couldn't even find a copy of his information on his uh, website. So he thought that he got hacked to you know the daylights out of him and all his information was destroyed and i've also had people pull phishing scams on me too so but i know other scams actually 
I've had some pretty interesting uh, occurrences. Um, people come out of the woodwork that I will never talk about. But the, uh, you know, so go read those articles about uh, Damien Eccles, Billy Sinclair. Uh, really interesting. He's done an interview with Ed Opperman. Uh, if you want to look that up, that's a really interesting interview about a guy. But uh, I think he smelled like there was all kinds of motifs that were in Life After Death that were in all of these other jail stories, like about how these guys had relationships with animals and had close relationship with rats and all this stuff mm. that um, he said, oh, I don't believe that at all. You know, it just is a good story. I will not. I absolutely refuse to buy the book. I will not do that. I, I, to if me, you can, oh. if you can go to, you know, he's written another book with his wife, like these love stories where he calls her the uh, monkey skins or some kind of weird name. If you want insight into some demented thinking, uh, go read that. But those two books, it's uh, life after death. And then the one with his wife is love stories from jail. I forgot the name of it, but uh, the, the one that I was surprised that he revealed that when he was in jail, and I include this in abomination that he performed the HGA ritual, which I think at first glance, most people would just write, read right over and not understand the, the full impact and import of that statement because uh, Crowley himself, he performed the HGA ritual. He actually um, took all of these phrases from Western esotericism and kind of changed them and ter- reinterpreted them for himself. But Crowley himself said uh, his HGA, his holy garden age, angel, was Satan. So when a Crowley lover who's admitted to being somebody who's love love with Crowley, Damien Eccles says, I've done the HGA ritual. You know, that kind of made me just literally fall out of my seat. Like, what? You know, I was. it's an amazing uh, admission. It is an amazing admission. So and he said he was wonderful... possessed. He oh, came yeah. right out and said that he had become possessed. Yeah, he had, he, had the, um, he had the soul of an old lady in his body that made him stronger or something like that. Yes. But here's what Crowley said about the holy guardian angel. The B666, Alistair Crowley, has preferred to let names stand as they are and to proclaim, proclaim simply that AWAS, the entity that dictated the Book of the Law to him in 1904, the solar phallic hermetic Lucifer is his own holy and guardian angel and the devil Satan of our particular unit of the star universe. So, so it's a, probably one of the more important phrases of Crowley is that one admission in that one paragraph is uh, describing AWAS and the Holy Guardian angel, angel as Lucifer and the devil. You know, when I read about the HGA, I was thinking, you know, the Holy Guardian Angel, that in itself is an abomination, and how perfect the title of your book is. Well, thanks. Yeah, I mean, it's, uh, I think the events of what happened in the West Memphis Three is an abomination, without question. And I, you know, I, I, I in the, the big intro of my book, I quote the abomination in Proverbs uh, 6, 6.19 which is, these six things the Lord hates. Yes, yeah, seven to him are an abomination. A proud look, a lying tongue, hands that shed innocent blood, blood, a heart that devises wicked plans, feet that are swift in running to evil, a fault in the witness who speaks lies, and one who sows discord among brethren. <laughs> That's the entirety of the West Memphis Three. Everything that happened in that, that one proverb is like a descriptive title or phrase for the whole West Memphis Three. Okay, lying, innocent blood, wicked plans, run to evil, lies. It's all there. Yeah, it's, uh, I've researched so much through the years and, you know, the last week or so, reading your book and, and brushing up on a few things that I could remember a little bit, but not quite the whole thing. It, it is so disturbing to see these videos and read about it. You know, I got to the point that it was affecting my dreams. It's pretty heavy. It really doesn't get heavier than than the elements of this case, unfortunately. I mean, it is tough to read that stuff. There's no question about it. It is. I mean, for me, when I was researching Abomination, I just kept scratching my head. I was like, what's going on? This is, I was like peeling a black onion or something, just different levels of like secret societies, mind control, Satanism. It was, it's a, and it's all done under the code of silence you know these guys are all keeping quiet and they all you know yeah it's it's it's, it's I, I understand your position it's it's bad i found it rather interesting that he got a tattoo of the black sun yeah. just knowing what all is associated with the black sun that of all the tattoos he could get he would get that one and didn't yeah. depp get a, a one at the same time 
the they titanical. got something. Yeah, it's an identical tattoo from the um, I Ching, which Crowley was really a master at the I Ching. It's uh, from he actually throw these sticks of the I Ching to get kind of readings, but uh, it's the I Ching uh, scale or whatever. I Ching formation is called Wind Over Heaven. And I was told by a, an experienced occultist that that is a representation of Satan in the occult, you know, because uh, Lucifer or the devil is the lord of the power, the prince of the power of the air. So um, they both have that together. They got it from a very well-known tattoo artist in Hollywood. And uh, it's rumored, I have never confirmed this, that I know for a fact that Henry Rollins has a uh, black sun tattoo kind of motif on his back. But I was told that Damien Knuckles and Marilyn Manson have, no, sorry, Johnny Depp and Marilyn Manson have a similar tattoo on their back. Yeah, so it's like a really weird heavy-duty cult behavior. And if you look at all these guys, like Dave Navarro is the head of this tattoo show, and uh, they all have similar motif tattoo. Damien Knuckles has like the, the um, uh, Chinese symbol for the devil or the dragon on his body. I mean, they all have meanings. He's tattooing the Theban alphabet. Also, Enochian language, this kind of language that was received by John D. and Edward Kelly. So, yeah, you all know these that, have deep mystery, yeah, deep meaning. You know that, uh, what was it, uh, Mer or Charles Manson was also affiliated with the OTO. And uh, after the Helter Skelter incident where they murdered all those people, um, was it he had the uh, Aryan symbol on his uh, forehead? Interesting. What's that? What's that symbol look like? The swastika. Oh, yeah, the swastika, right. So, right. so um, yeah, I mean, they all, uh, one of his followers had the X on her forehead, uh, Mary Jane Houghton or one of those girls. They've been seen seeing the same satanic sign, some of the people in the family, that like 666 sign where you, you know, hold your finger up to your eye or whatever. They've, I mean, I have that all in my book, Children of the Beast. I cover him because Manson, uh, they know he was affiliated with a group called the Solar Lodge of the OTO which was kind of an OTO offshoot that was in um, Los Angeles at the time. And Crowley, one of Crowley's followers, one of his chief followers, a guy by the name of Grady McMurtry, went to the FBI and said, hey, he wasn't a member of the OTO. They're not part of us, uh, which is kind of an interesting statement that he'd come out of the woodwork to uh, make that statement. But, uh, yeah. Well, they, even, they even tried to run Kenneth Grant off, and Kenneth Grant was the one that took over after Aleister Crowley died. Right. Um, you know, he wrote several books talking yeah, tons, about like five or six or nine or something yeah yeah he's got well over nine because i've got nine of them right here yeah why would they try to run over him well they ran right. him off they were all these fights within the oto after crowley died for um who was going to take it over so yeah uh, Murtry was supposed to be the caliph and kenneth grant actually lived with crowley in hastings uh up to the end of his life maybe in a cottage off of where crowley lived and studied under his foot and so he was expected to be the follower, but he actually had different ideas than the general OTO. And uh, so they actually um, fought to keep him out. And uh, there were other people, some other guy from Brazil who tried to take the leadership. But um, I don't think it was ever resolved for like 15 or 20 years. There really wasn't a proper line of succession after Crowley. Very interesting. Chad, did you have any more questions? Uh, no, I'll save, uh, the, if we get into esoteric stuff, that'll be a whole nother episode. <laughs> well, is there anything, William, that we have missed that you wanted to share tonight? Would you also let everyone know where they can purchase your book, where they can find your webpage, how to contact you, all the information? Of course. Um, I think we covered everything. So I think we did a great job covering everything. Thanks for having me on your show. Uh, my book. Yeah, my book is available at occultinvestigations.com. You can get signed copies of my three books, Prophet of Evil, Children of the Beast, and Abomination. Um, the uh, Children of the Beast just came out. I haven't even put it on Amazon yet, but uh, you can get it there. Um, I also have tons of videos on the West Memphis 3 at my YouTube page, Occult Investigations, so you can see a lot of stuff that I've just been following the case. Um, I'm also on Facebook and Twitter, <clears throat> so if you can find me under William Ramsey. Yeah, that's basically it. I mean, I think that this is still an ongoing case. I mean, it's still, the people are still around, the, the main actors are still alive, so it's really something, I think, for everybody to keep an eye on. I mean, I think uh, people have gotten wise to Damien Eccles, and he's not on TV shows anymore. The whole idea of him and Magic Revolution and his, his desire to kind of transform the world into this kind of magical thing, he thinks everything else is mundane and 
mediocre. Um, mm -hmm. It's kind of like this kind of distinction that Harry Potter has, like where everybody else is a muggle and I'm a magician and stuff like that. But he's actually said, one of the interesting things he said in West of Memphis, his thing, is that he wanted to be the greatest magician that ever lived. So he has very high ambitions and something to be very aware of. I have to tell you, William, that that is ironic because with him even stating also that he found people mundane, I also connected that to Harry Potter. Interesting. Yeah, it's like that. I mean, I think the I think J.K. Rowling knows a lot of witchcraft, and I write about her in Children of the Beast, but she clearly knows. I mean, Harry Potter is basically a five and six letter word that leads up to 11, the number of magic. Five is the pentagram, six is the hexagram, the symbol of the magician coming together, the microcosm, the macrocosm, and their view of like the, the whole school of study of magic and then everybody else is mundane or just not into it is a very common mindset within the occult, and out, common mindset and outlook. Well, you just, you just said quite a bit right there without even realizing it. That's the thing is in uh, the book of the law, it actually says, uh, or uh, who is it? Uh, Alistair Crowley comes out and says that they, you will know us by our number, and the number is eleven. Right. So the five plus the six adding up and equal an eleven. And Harry Potter, there you go. It's all there. Well, Harry Potter's wand, wand is also eleven inches long. So you know, it's she knew a lot. She knows, well, knows a lot about alchemy, all that stuff. Yeah. Well, even Alistair Crowley's most famous quote, the you know, uh, "Do as thou wilt shall be the whole of the law." It's eleven words. That's it. It. 11 was his number, man. That's all yep. there. 9 11. Yeah. And that would explain, too, why Rowling went from having nothing to becoming famous seemingly overnight. Yeah. Well, it's suspected, um, some people have suspected she has a hidden hand behind her, that she's a front person for a group, which uh, I wouldn't be surprised at all. Wouldn't, wouldn't surprise me at all. Although hmm. she does, she is well educated, she has a degree in uh, classics. So she she probably has read stuff. She's also there was a lawsuit about her. I haven't been able to follow up the lawsuit, but uh, she borrowed a lot of ideas from another book, and that author had uh, credible claims, but she didn't. The other author didn't win. So she there's more. To, there's a big backstory, and her name actually uh, J K Rowling Cade's the eleventh letter of the alphabet. She actually invented that letter. That's actually not her born given name. So mm -hmm. just tell you a lot. Well, William, it has been a pleasure to have you on. It, it's been wonderful to be able to discuss the West Memphis Three yes. with someone that is so knowledgeable about it and has done the research that you've done and very much appreciated. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for having me. I'm glad to be here. Well, would you please do the honor of saying tonight's closing prayer? All right, will do. Thank you. Uh, Dear Lord, thanks for bringing us together tonight. Thank you for having me on the show with Kay and Chad. It's always uh, wonderful to be with fellow Christians and discuss topics um, that we can all identify with and acknowledge our important topics for our understanding. Uh, Lord, bring your spirit upon us to take this knowledge and put it to good use and integrate it properly under your guidance. And we ask these things, O Heavenly Father, in the name of thy Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. 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 Thank you, William. Thank you, Thank you, Chad. Well, that's going to do it for tonight, everyone. Thank you so much for tuning in, and we pray that you all have a blessed week. Good night, everyone. Good night.